Welcome to this special edition of the Hyperfast Agent Show. Today, we are showcasing another speaker from the Hyperfast Summit, which was held in Boca Raton, Florida in February of 2022. Today, we are featuring Brian Rodriguez. He is a West Point graduate, Army veteran, CEO of the Rodriguez Group, which has served over 1,200 clients in Colorado. And last year, he closed the third largest hotel ever in Colorado, which earned him a multiple six-figure commission check. In this episode, he talks about how to go out, get creative, and do deals that are bigger than you ever dreamed of. Check it out. Perfect. First of all, I want to say thank you guys for all coming out here. It's a big decision you guys made, right, to continue your networking, right, to continue who you guys are. So I want to say thank you for coming out here because we all travel from different places, right? Next, uh, I want to really thank Dan and Carrie. I've been with Dan and Carrie. My wife actually introduced us to Dan and Carrie years ago at, at the first Hyperfast. And just, you know, they, they're, I, you know I, sometimes I think of Carrie as like the business mother, you know, for us. And, uh, and I really thank her and I thank Dan uh, uh, e even more because Dan went to my arch rival alma mater uh, at, uh, Navy, at the Naval Academy. I went to Army. So it's a really unique bond. So really, I want to say thank you for taking the risk, really taking the sacrifice and the investment into creating this platform and the environment for all of us. Okay, so please just give a warm uh, round of applause for Carrie and Dan. Now, before I get into the agenda today, um, I really want to put a disclaimer. So uh, I'm crazy. Just to let you know, I'm crazy. Uh, I'm Puerto Rican. <laughs> I'm Puerto Rican. I played nose tackle. So if you know anything about nose tackle, it's right. I like to be in the thick of things. I married a beautiful, beautiful wife, Lana Rodriguez. She's right there. Um, so what that means is that I'm going to be very animated. I'm going to be. I'm going to want some communication because uh, we're going to go through a journey. Okay. So today's agenda, right, is I'm a broker. So regardless, I'm going to advocate for broker, right, for, for finding your agent and understanding that if you have the agent on your team, you're going to be set, I promise you. Someone that you're able, that you know that listens, that good at their job, and most importantly, cares. Now, I'm also going to tell you a story, a real life story, of how I closed the third largest hotel in Colorado, how I represented both the buyer and the seller. And it and, and literally, I, I, I recorded the whole thing. So it's like a bunch of Costco free samples that I'm going to show you. Now, furthermore, I'm going to talk about the seven elements of negotiations. So these seven elements of negotiations have been endorsed by the U.S. Army, Harvard Business Review, a bunch of corporations that literally, if you take these seven elements, you can apply them to any negotiations. And luckily, real estate's all contract based, so you can prepare before, during, and after. But really what I'm here for, I, I think, is that with my story and this case study, that I help everyone reach their potential. And yeah, that might, might, clowns, uh, might sound cliche or whatever, but we all came here for something, right? Whether we're going to buy our first property, right? We're going to get into it. We're going to get our Airbnbs. I guess that's the hottest thing to do right now, wholesaling, right? We want to take action. I really think in life, you know, God really puts us on here so we can find our potential, okay? So you guys ready? Yeah. No, remember, disclaimer, come on, let's get, let's get some energy. We're about to have a happy hour soon. So, like I said, I literally recorded everything from the beginning to the end because I felt that if I closed this deal, I had to share this story so that you guys can all learn from my failures and the lessons learned, right? Ready? So there it was, 2020. COVID breaks out. It's April 2020. And I'm like, hey, babe, I think I'm going to leave residential because we've been real blessed with residential. But I felt that commercial real estate was underserved. And, I, and, and, and 
and we knew that the, the market was going to take a hit, right, with hospitality, service industry, retail. I knew there was an opportunity. And, and I always remember like what Warren Buffett always says, right? You have to be greedy when others are fearful. And so it was like the one time where we all get to be greedy, right? So I took it upon myself and became a commercial broker. And there I am, first day of school with braces and happy to be a commercial agent, right? Now, when you go into a new venture, you always want to have a mentality. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident in God, but not, not really arrogant. I'm really confident in my ability to make a difference in whatever organization I'm in. So when you enter a new venture or you take a new action, really set your mentality here, okay? And Zig Ziglar says it best, right? Confidence is going after Moby Dick in a rowboat and bringing the tartar sauce too. I mean, if that doesn't like get you hype, I, I don't know what does because I felt that was awesome. And that's the mentality I've always taken and I wanted to apply it uh, to commercial real estate. Now, so I'm in commercial real estate. It's July 2020. It's the summer that I'm in commercial real estate, and I got the chance to find my first whale, right? It's 314 West Bijou Street. It's beautiful. It's just over about one acre, over 100,000 square feet, over 140 units, $15 million. We leveraged one of our clients that was in our residential uh, company who owned a hotels, and he wanted to sell it. And I was like, wait a minute. This is my time, right? I've been looking for my, my Moby Dick, right? And, uh, and I got a buyer, and we went under contract, and it failed miserably, literally miserably. And so I was like, well, what do I do? It's my first time, right? So the next thing I did is that we moved right into network. Remember that network equals net worth. So I literally called up, right, one of my networks who went to school with me, went to Afghanistan with me. He was a great friend of mine, Mark Allen, and he happened to be an amazing broker in Dallas, right? And so that's why it's so important, right? When we go to these events, right, I'm pretty sure if you stay in touch with one of these people, they will help you get to wherever you're going. And so I called them, and on the day of my birthday, and this is now August 2020, I go, I need help. My deal fell apart. Do you have a buyer that can make this work? He's like, I met this guy. He does a hotel conversions to apartment. Um, let, me, uh, let me get it. Let me, let me introduce you. So there is, there's the email we met, and uh, it, it was great, but not really. So this, this company is called Sheer Capital. They're out of Austin, Texas, and their niche is hotel to apartment conversions. So, you know, the more sophisticated, they're going to have a criteria, right? So immediately I got another failure. So Sheer Capital immediately said, no, like, hey, that deal's not going to work. Why? Because in hotel conversions, they really need a lot of units, so economies of scale. They need to be at 50,000 a door, and in this case, we're at just over 100,000 a door. And so the numbers didn't work because, the, because when you do hotel conversions, the challenge is the unknown. You don't know how much renovation is going to happen because it's very intricate, right? When you've got a big hotel with a lot of amenities, uh, they don't know. And the city is probably going to impose some challenges and then the building code. So they really need to be at 50000 a door or less. So I was hurt, and I was like, well, that, that, that ended fast. But what's great is that when the client gives you uh, their criteria, they're also giving you their objections. And so everyone tries to get to yes, but I really think everyone needs to just chase the objections. So the more you understand their objections on why they don't want to buy this or why they don't want to sell this, you really start getting into their interest and their purpose. Uh, so I took that, and this time, I know I found it. This was a beautiful, I mean, literally, it's, it's called Hotel Legante. It sits over three acres, over 300,000 square feet, 500 units, and it was bought just at the right time. You know, a lot, of, a lot of things with luck, right? It comes with preparation meets opportunity. So I definitely was preparing myself, uh, you know, in this moment, right? And so at this point, the seller was at, I mean, he bought it right. 28,000 a door. I mean, where can you find anything at 28,000 a door? And so the buyer, I knew that if I got the buyer to offer on this, that the buyer would be able to literally satisfy all his criteria. So remember, his criteria was hundreds of units, and he needed to be at 50,000 a door. 
So in this case, the seller was at $28,000 a door, and that if we offered, it would literally be at $50,000 a door. Does that make sense? So, but as brokers, we're not going to get paid if what? We don't have a contract, right? So I needed, to get on, I needed to get the listing contract first before revealing the goods. So what do you do? I literally got on the phone. And in this day and age, I feel like communication's kind of lost, right? We all focus on literally taxing, social media. And, and when you start, I feel like the higher you go, the more intimate the process has to be. There's a lot of money that goes involved, so you got to get on the phone. Um, and, and when you get on the phone, it's amazing because you, you have a chance to demonstrate the passion. And, and, you know, our 45th president says, nothing great in this world can be accomplished without passion, right? And so passion is so important. And literally, on the phone, I got the, both <laughs> the buyer, uh, correction, the seller, to agree to giving me the listing. And I'll go into details later about that, but... Um, I got him to give me the, uh, the listing. And so in that moment, you have to be able to demonstrate who you are, what you can offer, and what's the value you're going to bring to the table. So we got the listing, and I immediately um, pr uh, pr presented the offer. And when I presented the offer, nothing worked out. They loved the price at $25 million, but they didn't like the buyer. They didn't like their story. They were afraid that they were going to get under contract for too long and that this was more of a, you know, a sophisticated buyer that was going to you know, be pro-buyer. The contract was definitely pro-buyer. It was longer. It had less commitments. And so what do you do, right? Literally, I got on a plane from Colorado Springs all the way to Midland, Odessa, Texas, literally. They weren't going to accept the contract, so I was like, I'm on my way. And, you know, I follow Grant Cardone, and Grant Cardone always says, good things come to those who wait, uh, but better things to co uh, come to those who go and get them. And so literally, I took a $700 flight in the middle of the, of the winter uh, back in October 2020, and I flew to Odessa. And this is a boom-bust town. It's West Texas, and I was going to go meet the seller to convince the seller that the buyer is worthy and that we can make this deal happen. And while I was there, I actually met a, a, Pujambi, a Punjambi artist, uh, big Indian music. And uh, he was actually a yogurt investor for the seller who I was going to meet. And so I was talking to him, trying to get some details on the relationship and, you know, how to approach him. So I thought that was really cool. Um, and then literally I showed up to the seller's Hotel Elegante in Odessa, Texas. And when we were there in Odessa, Texas, I literally pulled up looking like a bouncer uh, coming here to eat uh, a buffet with him. He would never met me. Uh, that's his acquisition director right there. And literally, this is an opportunity to make an impression. So Ryan Surhan, also a, another VIP that came out here to the, to the last Hyperfest, he says the first impression is your last impression. And so this is so, so important. When you get a chance to meet someone, you make sure you always break bread, but make sure you deliver legitimacy of who you are. Make sure they know your story. But most importantly, you have to know everything about them. Uh, I take that very ser seriously when you get into key leader engagements because um, they know that you'll care. So I made the deal work. And so I got under contract. And so this is a video. I don't know if you can hear it. But uh, that's just me celebrating. So I got this deal under contract. And this deal under contract was $25 million, 500 units, and, and we were supposed to close in six months. So that's just me talking crazy. But uh, under contract, yeah, do the work. Yeah, yeah, you always got to do the work. So just like anything, right, you, you get married or you get under contract, right, everything's good until it's not right? Uh, we, were doing, we were doing appraisals, right? We were doing inspections. We had consultants. We had the whole development team. I'm thinking this deal is ready to go, right? But just like all these other speakers have talked about, right? There's always government involved in regulations, so you got to be prepared for that. And in this case, we got hit with uh, a big one that, we, that I didn't even expect through the due diligence. And it was that when you convert a hotel or when you do some major development, the city is always going to provide their review 
Um, it's, it's, it could be called a development review, but each department has a chance to say something. And in this case, the Parks and Recreation had a chance uh, to give their two cents, and their two cents actually turned into almost $700,000. And so the reason why they were imposing a fee was that for every unit you bring online that's stationary, that you had to provide parks and recreation, like dirt, for them. And it's like, where are you going to find that? Like, you know, you either have to go buy seven acres or you're going to have to pay a fee in lieu of. And that really t uh, created a stalemate. And within that stalemate, the deal literally was falling apart. And while it was falling apart, guess what? I got COVID. And I got COVID not like a little cough, cough. I got COVID like stuck in my basement, quarantine, locked out, key thrown away for two months. And it was like, the kids were like, daddy's sick, don't go in there, you know? And I was like, it was so bad. And I wasn't able to perform or execute. And this was like the biggest deal of my life. I mean, again, it was $25 million, by the way, 4% commission. And so you can imagine how you're feeling right now. And so here's a little Costco-free sample of me dying. Uh, and, <laughs> and I'm literally... I mean, I have some other videos, but anyways, I'm literally dying, but I'm, I'm trying to express that, hey, I can't do my job. We're in the most sensitive part of the contract that's make or break. I mean, literally almost a million dollar fee, and I can't do my job. And what's great, remember the relationship I, I started building with the seller when I met him? That was so important to the point where he calls me and says, hey, Brian, I know, I know you got the Rona. But we're going to make sure this deal gets through. But before we do that, can I pray over you? And he was just a real, a big Christian. You could look this guy up, John Bushman. I mean, he's a, I want to be him when I grow up. But uh, he prayed over me. And so, you know, like the lazy Catholic got on me. I'm like, yes, let's do it. And we start praying about it. And, uh, and, we, and we, uh, he actually just moves forward. And he, and he continues it and actually makes a deal happen with the buyer. So they eventually negotiated a deal for that concession. And so life is good, right? I'm on about to clear to close. We're having pre-celebrations. This is with the buyers, sheer capital out of Austin, Texas. We're having a blast. Those are my partner agents to the side of me. James and Jordan, they're not here right now. They better be working. But, uh, <laughs> but no, that, that, was, uh, that was at the party. And it was an amazing, amazing time and uh, but again, like, like anything else, challenges keep occurring. And boom, literally hours before closing, hours before closing, I'm thinking we're going to enjoy, we're going to pop some bottles, right? And no, the seller calls me, that, that, that amazing gentleman who prayed over me. He's like, hey, Brian, you know, we're about to close tomorrow. I mean, we're about to close in a couple of hours. Do you think uh, you can help me out? I'm in a little predicament. You remember that concession I did, you know, the, the, the $700,000 concession? Well, it happened to be that he split it with the, with the other party, with the buyer. But they never asked me to concede to that or provide a concession to make up for it. And so he literally asked me hours before, is like, hey, Brian, can you please reduce your commission from 4% to 3%? I mean, all the brokers in the room, what would you guys do? Fuck that. We got one fuck that. We got one flip birdie. You know? What else? No? Other people would be like, keep going on? Dude, I'm, I'm hiring you. You're going to be my hype man. Uh, no, so you're exactly right. And I was like, babe, I'm so mad. I want to say something. And, you know, it, it, it's a trade off, right? It's a trade between the relationship or just this monetary gain. And I'm trying to. You always want to talk about the difference. And so the difference is 250000 quarter million, right? And I'm thinking, I'm like, man, but if I, if I stop this, he technically has more power to just be like, get out of here. I don't, I don't need you. Or do it again. Or do it again, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And so what I did was you always got to think about this. When the client, and, and Dan talked about this. There's two things in an offer, right? Price and terms. And so when the client says price, you immediately say the opposite. And I said terms. Why? Because I knew this client had other properties that I was able to sell and take advantage of. So we negotiated where I'd be like, hey, I'll reduce this to show that I'm committed to you, but
but I, but I also want to know that you're committed to me for the future. And so he, able, he was able to give me about two to three properties. One we're negotiating on the sale of one of his, his big mansion flips. But uh, he was able to commit for me to that. So that was a great teaching point. But in the industry, we always say that you're a commission away from closing. So uh, that's literally the CDA. And you can see the 750 commission paid at settlement to my brokerage capital property group, but that's 750,000. So that, uh, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> so it's, it, I don't know. I feel like comparison is always a killer joy. But yeah, when you compare it to a million, but anyways, it's 750,000. And we did it, right? So we're, uh, you got to play this. This is priceless. Can you? Is there, a video? Uh, is there a sound? Oh, no sound? Okay. Damn. But anyways, so fireworks are going on, right? And what's really, you know, this is the day that I close. 30 December, I close. And there's fireworks going off in our, in our hotel unit. And I'm like, babe, I can't believe it's happening. And I was like, oh, I did this. It's so crazy. And my daughter goes, no, God did this. So that's what she's saying. So it's a really special but what's funny is something above God did it, and it was my wife, Lana. She actually surprised me, and she did the fireworks on, on the day we closed. I literally thought I was the luckiest person, but, you know, my wife took care of that. So, uh, but we did it, right? And so $25 million, third largest hotel in Colorado, 500 units. I represented buyer and seller, and it was probably the first major hotel apartment conversion probably in the region. And so it's, it's huge, and I, I love that hotel. But anyways, um, so what's the purpose of all this, right? What, what, I mean, great story, Brian, right? But the thing is, is like, you know, how did this happen? How did I understand how to communicate with something that took literally just over a year? And, and as I mentioned at the agenda, it's called the Seven Element Preparation Tool, and so, like I said, it's endorsed by the U.S. Army, by Harvard Business, by many corporate companies, and they break it down into easy seven elements. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take these seven elements and we'll apply it to the case study I just said. But if you remember these seven elements, I guarantee you that the next negotiations you go into, that if you just remember these, you literally can immediately be more than prepared. You know why? Because the other party's not going to do it. Let's be honest, right? So the first one is interest. Second one is options. Alternatives, legitimacy, commitments, relationship, and communication. And when you take these seven elements, you literally can create a circle of value, we call it, where if you, you can leverage all these elements so that you can yield a, a good outcome. And so the first one is interest. Now, we all know that buyers want to buy and sellers want to sell. But like I said before, it's about getting to the purpose. Why is the seller being a bitch about not selling the way we need to sell, right? And the reason why is because he wanted to protect his stakeholders, his employees. We were in a time of COVID, and he's like, Brian, you need to keep this on the wrap. So this was all off market for just over a year. And he knew that sooner or later, the, 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 the city was going to get involved. But if he can reduce that exposure, that was really his interest. And, the, and then the buyer's interest was more focused on, they were a national developer. They were a national hotel converter. Um, so they didn't, not, they didn't want to be looked at as entering a new market, getting, getting taken advantage of, right? It was new to them, and so they wanted to buy it their way. So the more you understand their interests, the more you understand their purpose, which would lead to what? Options. Because you can start creating options for them. And options are so important because you can get creative. But in this case, there's really, no, there's really just one option, right? It's to buy this hotel and convert it. That was the mission. Obviously, you can go into different types of purchases, right? Could they buyers, I mean, could they sellers finances? Could they rent to own? Could they buy like a piece of it and then go and buy the next piece of it later? Uh, but the, the purpose of this is that options are where you really make your money in trying to satisfy that purpose, that interest. Now, there's alternatives, right? And I'm always a little bit um, 
apprehensive when it comes to alternatives because the when you start getting when you start entertaining alternatives you start going away from the purpose right the purpose is to purchase this property or sell this property not rent this property the buyers could have rented this property that's not what they want to do uh they could stay in austin and just continue doing their mission or they can take the other hotel that i first had that they said no to right so when you have alternatives it's very important to understand what's your best alternative. And I would say that if you have a better alternative, you usually have a better leverage. And I think in this case, the buyers didn't have the better alternative. The seller did. The, seller, the buyers really wanted this property. They wanted to enter the market in Colorado Springs, come out with a bang. Legitimacy. Legitimacy to me out of these seven, three are probably top, top two. Uh, with legitimacy, again, it's, it's so important, especially in, in, this, in this day and age, right? You know, when I come on here on stage, I want you guys to know that I am committed, that I am good at my job, that, I'm, that, you're, that you know I'm going to listen and that I ultimately care. And literally, when I met uh, John, he knew my resume, everything. Like, I literally take it as I'm interviewing with a Fortune 500 company. I showed him a step-by-step -step process of what was going to happen from the moment we received the offer to when we were going to close, except that whole parks and recreation fee. I didn't, I didn't see that coming. But I literally showed him, I, and I built this little step-by-step -step guide to converting your hotel. Literally, I made it up and created, uh, and, and obviously underwrote it uh, with the rules by the city, but I literally uh, monetized it or merchandised it. And most importantly, due diligence. You know, as brokers or anything, you got to know the numbers. You have to be able to illustrate what their return is going to be, how they're going to leverage all the conference spaces, all the amenities. You got to be able to show what it's going to rent for, what, it's gonna, what could it sell for, the whole nine yards. And you really do that in a more sophisticated, you know, with the discounted cash flow. You have to be able to show what it could sell, you know, the IRR, all that stuff. And I'm not going to really get into that. But the more you're legitimate in this day and age, take pride in that. To me, it's so important uh, because there's just too many, you know, gray area. Um, next, so commitments. Luckily, we're in real estate, and a contract is literally a commitment. So it's actually, you know, natural to in, in, in real estate to get into negotiations, and, and commitments, the first thing people really want to hear in commitments is earnest money. And when you start getting into these bigger deals, it's all about can you put money now and when can it, be, when can it go hard, right, non-refundable. And in this case, it was a quarter million that had to go hard. And that was one of the first parts of the negotiation where how committed is the buyer uh, to the seller? In this case, we, we ended up just negotiating a um, kind of a tier, right? So the, first, the moment we went under contract, it was $10,000 hard. No money, you know, not, nothing too big. And then after the pre-development review, uh, which was 15000 then after the rezoning period was the remaining amount. And so uh, when you, you always have to make sure in negotiations that the other parties are committing as you go along the, the dialogue, the engagement. Um, relationship. Relationship, like, is so important. Like, I would say it's definitely the number one out of the entire seven elements um, in, in real estate, I, I, I learned from Brian Buffini, who's, who's an amazing educator. You know, he, he, told, uh, he told us that relationship is, is based on trust, but then what's trust based on? And trust is based on, you know, how good are you listening? Are you good at your job? And do you care? If you literally just take those three, I promise you, any relationship will work, especially in, uh, in real estate. And the, and the story is, there's that beautiful American flag in Colorado. Uh, we give that out to our clients, uh, you know, obviously for residential when they close. Uh, but immediately after I met him, I send it next day air. And he put that up in his boardroom. So this guy is a multimillionaire. I guess, you, I mean, you can look him up, John Bushman. And he puts that next to all his big achievements. And so I knew that the relationship we would have would be enduring. So I knew that every time something would happen or, or anything, he would remember me in this deal. So relationship is everything. And then communication. You know, again, I, I can't emphasize enough. We live in this world where it's all about texting, 
very limited reaction, uh, almost superficial. And so you have to always be engaged. And I put this text here just to show that even at the uh, $25 million level, we're like talking nonsense if you read it. Uh, it's not, it's not as, as professional as you would think. But uh, in, in this communication, this case study, it was just over a year. So you can imagine how, how exhausting it was to communicate over a year. Imagine just showing a buyer for what a year and they don't buy, right? How exhausting is that? Imagine you got a, a commercial deal that, you know, a lot is at stake. It's going to change the landscape of the city. You know, how do you continue that communication? And there's three themes I always, always think about in, in communication is one, you need to be consistent uh, of who you are. Remember, the, the, the client hired you for who you are, not for who you think you should be or what you think the market's telling you to be, they hired you for who you are. So if you don't stay consistent, it's going to be a challenge because the, the deal itself will get emotional for the clients and they will get out of whack. You have to stay consistent of, of who you are. Uh, second, being refreshing. Um, in, in, in a, you know, not all deals are fast and furious. Not all deals are long and extensive. It could be a hybrid of both. And so people will lose sight of the end state, Right? They forgot that they're under contract of the third largest hotel in Colorado. They forgot that they're going to sell this and make $11 million profit, and they're going to 1031 exchange that, right? So you need to be refreshing. You need to remind them, hey, we're almost there. You're about to be closed, and you're going to go on to your next deal. Even at that level, um, you definitely got to remind them of that. And then finally, discipline. You know, my wife, my wife I say discipline so much, she thinks it's like a bad word. But, it, but it's not. It's, it's something to where, you know, we are all building our skill, right? We're all building our, our, our competency. And so you have to keep that consistent. You have to keep that discipline because you will get complacent. And you never want to be complacent uh, when you're dealing with, with anything, even if it's a $200,000 home to a $25 million hotel. Stay disciplined in your art and in your science. But anyways... Thank you so much for hearing this story and the seven elements. This is what the hotel will look like very shortly. So it turned into Hotel Agante, and now it will be called the Alta Living. Alta is a kind of a Latin or Italian word for height, high, muy alta, very tall. So, you know, in Colorado Springs, we, we, we have the America's Backyard. We have the Pikes Peak region, beautiful mountains. So they named it a High Hotel, but Alta Hotel. And uh, I mean, Ulta Living, which will be turned into a, an apartment. And so, anyways, I, I don't know how much time I have. I think I'm, I'm done. But am I done? I don't know. But anyways, questions and answers? Anything? Okay, two. Yeah, one. Uh, what was the biggest... Uh struggle that you had transitioning into commercial on the other side? I, I like to say I didn't have a, a, a challenge. However, uh, I would say in commercial real estate, right, majority of the deals are all off market. And so, you, you know, we talk about wholesaling with Matt, right? Um, I mean, literally, that's what you're doing. You're on the phone and you're constantly engaging opportunity, right? Mary, you said about like, what's the city doing? What's going on, right? You have to be in tune with the infrastructure, with the built environment, so you can see opportunity. I know that, uh, and, and then now you're going to let me go on to why I think the commercial industry is so underserved. You as residential brokers, right, or, or as, as just investors, you know the market, and so you really got to tap in, see what's going on, and find opportunity. And that was the hardest, but it was the most exciting, right? That you really had to really know every corner so that when you got on the phone with that owner of an X building, that you were able to show him or her, you know, what are the opportunities, the challenges, you know, the whole SWOT analysis um, and, and, and why they should go with you. And I promise you the other, the other parties are not going to be as educated as you because they really don't care. Like, I care about Colorado Springs. Yeah. When you're looking for off-market deals, off deals for investors, because I run into that issue where I get investors wanting to buy in that range. Yeah. And, you know, LoopNet, Crexy, all that, yeah. you know, it's something that I want to get into, but... 
I'm used to doing the off market on the residential side. So as far as contacting those sellers, are you just doing it the same way as you would residential? You just find the seller's information and try to identify those properties that you've had your eye on just from knowing the area? Yeah. So, I mean, I would tell you fundamentally, it's no different. Maybe tactically could be different. So, for example, uh, you said crack C. So, CoStar is, you could say, the equivalent of the MLS in commercial real estate. And so, you click it. It technically has their information, but it may not be updated. So, you literally know, have to know how to search and find the LLCs, see who owns them. But you know the town, and you know who to talk to. You're like, oh, I know this person knows that person, right? So, you find it through networking. And usually, if, I, if I'll meet their secretary, or something like that, and I'll, and I'll start beating them, right? right. Um, I'll send a gift directly to the owner so that I get a reason to call. You know, uh, I think Ryan Serhan did it one time where he was like, he sent a developer, he loved reading, and he sent him like a bookcase of books, you know? And so get their attention. And, uh, you know, I've been real blessed, you know, obviously marrying my wife, but we have a big Lana Rodriguez group, so we are a top 10 team in the market. So right there, the legitimacy is right there. They, I can easily ref, reference that. Right. Another commercial broker is not going to be able to do that. I'm right. telling you, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. That's why they end up with like CBRE, Frank Knight, JLL, all these brands that they invest in the leads and then the commercial agent just falls in. I'm right. telling you, it's for the taking. Yeah, no, I definitely see that, that there's a need for more commercial oh, agents. Oh, and, and, and women, they, they kill it all the time. There's yeah. just like there's like one woman in yeah, the office exactly. like who, who's not doing anything so definitely an opportunity there, of course. Yeah, my one of the things that stood out to me the whole presentation was you know this took a year right yes. so, so you're looking at a year long deal and I I think I'm a pretty tenacious guy I like to go out and hunt and put meat on the table I I mean honestly man I think I probably would have punted this deal a couple times so like how important. How important is like mindset and positivity and sticking with it and grinding it out? How, how important was that? On oh, this man. Day? I'm so glad you asked that. Lana's the only one who just knows the anxiety I had. I was like, I don't hate, I hate this deal. This sucks. I don't even need this. And she's like, no, just keep going forward. Just keep going forward. And that's what I was talking about in the beginning, right? Mentality. Whatever venture you do, again, we all came here to take a, a, make a decision, right? To take action into something. You got to get your mind right for that. And that's why I was acting like I was like, you know, looking for Moby Dick on a rowboat bringing the tartar sauce. Like I was going to take this guy down sooner or later, right? And uh, it, was, it was exhausting, right? But again, it goes back to kind of like the discipline. Like, you know you meant for this. There, there's no, I mean, the fact that it was even possible is it should be the motivation to at least see it through. You know, at the University of Georgia, I grew up in Georgia, they always have this thing called finish the drill, right? The, the Georgia Bulldogs, they won the national championship. So finish the drill. And you know that at the end of the drill, you did it. You, you did what you could. But no, that, thanks for asking that. It was very exhausting. I played center. I bet I can still block you, by the maybe, way. Maybe, 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 maybe not, but okay. <laughs> Is that any questions? Right? Yes, sir. Yeah, of course. So last question. Um, since you, you were representing the buyer and the seller for the building, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so which one was the one that you went to go meet? The seller. The seller. Okay, so that's the guy with the office that you gave, you gave him. Yes, stuff. sir. So when you told him about the 3%, where he, he came at you and he's like, look, we got to, you know, take off a percent. And have you sold any more of those properties? And did you write up a contract for that specific, hey, look, I'll give you the 1%, you know, but let's, let, you know, let's write yeah. it out. So the, the follow-on one was a listing, $3.5 million. It was an old Macy's that he condoed out. So he condoed out the top and bottom. So I have the bottom Macy's, and I have a listing for that, 3.5%, 2%. Uh, but uh, that one, we, got our, we have a listing contract, and I'm showing it, and I hope to receive an offer. Actually, I can, I can show you during happy hour. It's a church group. By the way, church groups are all these non-denominationals. -dem they're getting excited for all this vacant space because they bring their people there and it's a party. And so, uh, uh, but the other one, his Hotel Elegante in Dallas, because uh, he franchised his own model, he won't let me, because uh, one, I'm not licensed there, or two, I, I really don't have a network there except Mark, uh, but he will let me sell it privately. So again, all commercial deals are off market. Doesn't need a like listing contract. I mean, technically, 
you know, what is it? Ryan Certain came to Florida and, and sold the largest, you know, house in, in Florida. So you really don't need uh, uh, to be licensed, but um, he preferred that I just keep it off market. Uh, again, he doesn't want to hurt his business owners, his, his employees. Uh, so he wasn't too uh, excited to market it, but he lets me privately show it. So we're scheduling some opportunity there. Awesome. But did you yeah. write up something, at least on no, paper? No, not for so. that one. It okay. was more like, but again, this guy's the type of person who'll pray over me, okay. you know? Yeah, right. So like, you know, there's but a, they're there's not a, all like that. Correct. And I it's mean, hard to trust. Someone oh, you who, don't, you, know. you don't trust. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I would say every year being with this guy every right. day, I mean, if I can't trust him, right, we right. don't need to do right. business, but no, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Uh, anything else I could talk all day like you guys see. Okay. That was awesome. Anyways, thank you, Dan and Carrie. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure and go to hyperfastagent.com to learn about upcoming in-person and online events. And don't forget to share this show with someone that you think could benefit from hearing it and make sure you subscribe on YouTube or anywhere that you can find podcasts. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyperfast Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyperfast shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests and improve our shows. So give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you want to see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos.